Hello and welcome to lecture number five. We will be discussing monetary policy, and this is from chapter five in your book. Up to this point, we've been talking about the Fed, and now we're going to be talking about how the Fed implements monetary policy. Uh, we're going to describe the mechanics of monetary policy. We're going to explain the trade offs involved in monetary policy. We'll describe how financial market participants respond to the Fed's policies. And we'll explain how monetary policy is affected by the global environment outside of the US. So first we'll discuss uh, the mechanics of monetary policy. So the Fed is constantly monitoring um, the economic situation in the US. So uh, the Fed monitors indicators of economic growth. So they'll look at GDP. Uh, this measures the total value of goods and services produced during a specific period. They'll look at national income. This is the total income earned by firms and individual employees during a specific, specific period. They'll also look at the unemployment rate. Um, remember, one of the, uh, the Fed's mandates is to maintain a low unemployment rate in the US, as well as keep st uh, stable prices. They'll look at other indices, indexes, uh, industrial production index, a retail sales index, a home sales index. So these are all um, indicators that the Fed will monitor and discuss uh, as they meet. Um, and they'll use these to, uh, to determine um, some forecasts for economic growth. Uh, these are not the only things that they'll use, but they will um, uh, rely on these heavily. So um, now we're gonna discuss um, some of the index of leading economic indicators. So leading economic indicators. Uh, we've got leading economic indicators which predict future economic activity. So when you see the word leading, that means it's an indicator that is meant to predict uh, the future. It's leading, it's coming before um, what's gonna happen. And so these are indicators uh, leading economic indicators. There's, there are coincident economic indicators, and these tend to reach their peaks and troughs at the same time as business cycles. So these are happening during at the same time. Leading happens before, and then we've got lagging economic indicators, which tend to rise or fall a few months after business cycle expansions and contractions. So they'll look at these indicators um, to help them make better uh, decisions for the future. Um, here are some of the leading indexes, coincident indexes, and lagging indexes that they may use. Um, and these are uh, announced on a regular basis. This is information that's announced uh, to the general public as well. So average weekly hours for manufacturing, Average weekly initial claims for unemployment insurance. Uh, at the time of this recording, we're right in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis, and um, unemployment uh, claims are at uh, some pretty historic levels, very high. Manufacturers new orders, index of new orders from customers, and so on and so forth. There are uh, a number of leading indicators that, um, that they will use and look at. Uh, the coincident indexes, employees and non-agricultural payrolls. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I worked with a Chinese uh, guy who um, invested in gold, and he um, only invested um, or mainly invested uh, when these types of announcements would come out. Um, and uh, he invested in the movement of the price of gold. So. Um, then there are lagging indexes, average duration of employment, inventories to sales ratios, um, average prime rate. And these things uh, come after, these come during, and these come before the business cycles. Um, there are monitoring indicators of inflation as well. Uh, they'll look at the producer and consumer price index. So you'll here the term CPI, consumer price index, or PPI, producer price index. Producer price index represents prices at the wholesale level, and the consumer price index represents prices paid by customers, so that's at the retail level. Uh, here are some other inflation indicators. Wage rates um, are periodically reported in various regions. Oil prices, 
These can signal future inflation because they affect the cost of some forms of production as well as transportation costs and the prices paid by uh, consumers for gasoline. Price of gold, closely monitored. I mentioned that I worked with an investor who um, was an expert in gold prices. Um, they tend to move in tandem with inflation. In some cases, indicators of economic growth are also used to indicate inflation. We'll talk a little bit more about inflation um, throughout the course of this lecture, um, but these are some things that the Fed will look at as they're trying to make decisions um, for the future. Uh, here's a, a, a last little comment, demand pull inflation. It occurs when excessive spending pulls up prices and, and we'll discuss that here in just a second. So the Fed, um, once the Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC, assesses economic conditions using uh, the tools that we just went through, it identifies its main concerns about the economy and determines the proper monetary policy that would alleviate its concerns. Now you'll remember the um, mandate of the Fed is to keep stable prices, so uh, keep inflation low and keep uh, employment high. Uh, monetary policy changes the money supply in order to influence interest rates. And so they're trying to influence um, market interest rates. Um, they've got two ways uh, or two approaches depending on what's happening um, in the environment, the economic environment, but one of those uh, are, is stimulative monetary policy. So they're trying to stimulate the economy. So the supply curve of loanable funds indicates the quantity of funds that would be supplied at that time at various possible interest rates. So we're, we're gonna look on the next slide, um, a, a figure of the supply curve of loanable funds. With a stimulative monetary policy, the Fed increases the supply of funds in the banking system, which can increase the level of business investment and hence aggregate spending in the economy. And we'll, we'll look at how this happens, um, but as we look at exhibit 5.2, you can see here um, the Fed is uh, taking steps uh, to move the supply of money, the money supply, shift it um, outward. So here we've got S1, um, which is the original money supply, but when the Fed gets involved and is trying to stimulate the economy, do a stimulative uh, approach uh, that should shift um, the supply curve for loanable funds outward. So without a change in demand, what we would see is the interest rate, the US interest rate would fall from I1 down to I2, okay? Well, what does that do? Well, as we can see here, I1 is here and I2 is here. And this is the level of business investment in the United States. So you can see when the interest rate drops, the level of business investment will increase from B1 to B2. So businesses are out there borrowing and spending. There's more business investment in the United States when we see the interest rates drop. So what are the effects of a stimulative monetary policy? Um, the impact on interest rates we just saw in the last slide, the quantity of loanable funds supplied exceeds the quantity of loanable funds demanded. The interest rate will decline to equilibrium. And we saw that going from S1 to S2. Um, so what is the logic behind the impact on interest rates? The depository institutions experience an increase in the supply of funds. Therefore, they borrow less funds or provide more short-term loans at lower interest rates. So people um, are able to borrow those funds at a lower interest rate. Um, so how does this affect the business cost of debt? So as business cost of debt decreases, firms implement more projects and spend more money. So if, the, if a company can borrow at a lower rate, then the, their cost of debt is lower which means that they can um, uh, implement more projects and spend more money, and this stimulates the economy. This results in more income to individuals or other firms, which allows more people to invest in the original company. So 
Um, so that's how it affects the cost of debt. How does it affect the cost of equity? Well, the, the firm's cost of equity is positively related to the risk-free rate. If you remember cap M from our finance 3250, um, uh, we use the risk-free rate to find what our cost of equity is. A lower risk-free rate means a lower cost of equity or a lower required rate of return. So here are a summary of the effects. So the effects on the treasury or the risk-free rate influences the cost of debt and the cost of equity. So we see both the cost of debt go down and the cost of equity go down um, as a result of the stimulative monetary policy because we see the, the rates are influenced. Cost of capital is reduced. So if you'll remember the weighted average cost of capital formula for from our uh, finance 3250 class, um, it took into account both the cost of debt and the cost of equity uh, to determine what the weighted average cost of capital is. And if both of those are reduced, then the cost of capital is reduced, which reduces the required return on cost of products. It encourages firms to spend more money and hire more employees. So here's a diagram of how this works. So the Fed implements a stimulative monetary policy. And that is aimed at reducing interest rates. If they're successful at reducing interest rates, it will reduce the cost of debt for firms. That's decreased. And the cost of equity is decreased. So the firm's total cost of capital or weighted average cost of capital decreases, and which also decreases the firm's required return on its projects. So as a result, they'll implement more, implement more projects, hire more people, purchase more materials, so on and so forth. And so it stimulates uh, growth in the economy when, um, when the Fed reduces the interest rate through their monetary uh, policies. Okay, so the Fed will also focus on uh, long-term maturities. What, what do we mean by long-term maturities? Um, you'll remember the Fed will issue um, treasury bonds and some of them are long-term and some of them are short-term, we call them short-term T-bills. Um, and part of their monetary policy is a focus on their longer term maturities. Um, in 2011 to 2012, the Fed implemented what they called Operation Twist. Um, the Fed sold holdings of short term treasuries, so like T bills, and used the proceeds to purchase long term treasury securities. So maybe they, they sold out in the, the public a whole bunch of one to three year uh, treasuries. So those are more short term. And with the proceeds, with the money that they got from selling those uh, treasury bonds, they then go out and repurchase or purchase their outstanding long term uh, treasury securities. So in theory, this will increase short term interest rates and decrease long term interest rates. So um, and that's because they're flooding the market with the short-term securities. So that will increase uh, the rates, um, decrease um, the, the price. Uh, and on the flip side, as they go out buying long-term securities, that increases the price, which uh, decreases the interest rates there. Um, the expected result, firms are more willing to borrow funds for spending on new projects, therefore stimulating the economy and creating jobs. Okay, so um, do they get it right all the time? They do not. Um, with their best efforts, sometimes their stimulative monetary policy might still fail. Um, one potential reason is there's limited credit provided by banks. So even though the Fed is pumping money out into the market um, uh, by buying back uh, their securities, um, uh, the banks may still not provide credit to their customers. So the banks will hold on to the cash and not, and not lend it out. So even if the Fed increases the level of bank funds, banks may be unwilling to extend credit to customers. And in really um, difficult times, and we are uh, potentially in one of those times, um, banks may be a little bit more stringent with their lending um, requirements. 
and they might not lend as much because they're scared that people will not be able to pay them back. Um, also, there's a low return on savings. Um, the lower the, the rate, uh, the lower the return on those who are saving their money. So if, if you put your money into a savings account, um, right now you're earning virtually nothing. Um, and so lower interest to income translates to lower spending. Um, also, there are adverse effects on inflation. When, when the Fed stimulates the economy uh, through their monetary policy, the effect of increase in money supply growth may be disrupted due to an increase in inflationary expectations. And we'll look about, we'll look in exhibit 5.4, which is also in your book of how this happens. So um, they, their aim to stimulate the economy may be uh, thwarted because people expect uh, inflation uh, to arise. Okay, so here, here's an illustration of that. Okay, so we've got S1, which is the original supply, and then S2 is a shift out because of the stimulative monetary policy. So we, uh, in our earlier uh, diagram, you saw us go from I1, and we slid along this demand curve um, down to I2. But what happens when um, there's an expectation that inflation will happen? Well, people are seeing the rates as, as they are now and thinking, well, we better borrow, we better start making these projects and doing um, the things that we need to do before we see inflation rise. And so what we, what we see then is a, a larger demand for uh, loanable funds because they want to implement their projects before inflation becomes a real issue. Um, and, and we've seen that before, you know, people, uh, with um, uh, like uh, a home mortgage, uh, they they may see the interest rates are so low um, that they want to get in on on that and and build the house um, before interest rates rise. And so then you see an increase in demand, which shifts um, the interest rate back up uh, to where it was. Um, some effects of restrictive monetary policy now. Now, up to this point, we've been discussing stimulative monetary policy, but sometimes the Fed um, needs to have a restrictive monetary policy. Um, increasing risk-free interest rate uh, will increase corporate costs of financing, therefore decreasing the level of business investment. So it, it does the exact opposite of the uh, stimulative. Uh, this causes businesses to decrease the level of investment. As economic growth is slowed, inflationary pressure may be reduced. And so uh, the Fed is trying to balance growth with inflation. Now, in a perfect world, you could have uh, constant growth with no inflation, but we don't live in a perfect world. And so the Fed sometimes sees inflationary pressures being strong uh, or, or even um, uh, in real inflation increasing, and so they'll have to um, slow the growth by restrictive monetary policy. So in, in this example, again, um, we're starting at S1, but instead of increasing uh, the amount of loanable funds, they take loanable funds out of circulation, um, and so the interest rate rises along the demand curve from I1 to I2. Similar thing here, um, we, our level of business investment moves from B1 back to B2 because of the increase in interest rates. So the Fed can affect economic conditions through its influence on the supply of loanable funds. Um, there's a lagged effect uh, on mon monetary policy. We call this uh, the first one recognition lag. This is a lag between the time a problem arises and the time it is recognized. Sometimes we don't recognize the problem until it's, it's been ongoing for some time. Implementation lag. This is a lag from the time a serious problem is recognized until the time the Fed implements a policy to resolve that problem. So we've got the first lag is, is being able to recognize it. Once uh, the Fed recognizes the problem, um, then there's a, a, a lag between the time they recognize it and the time they implement it. 
And then the impact lag is the lag until the policy has its full impact on the economy. So right now um, with COVID-19 happening, uh, there's been a recognition obviously because uh, the Fed has taken some very extreme steps uh, to implement. I don't think they're done implementing. We will see additional stimulus. Uh, the impact though um, will come sometime down the road. We don't really know what the full impact is on the economy of the stimulative uh, monetary policy that the Fed is currently enacting. And, uh, and it may not um, all be good impact. We, we might see some negative impacts as a result. Okay, so here um, is a diagram of how uh, the stimulative monetary policy and restric restrictive monetary policy works. So with stimulative, the Fed is buying back treasury securities. So investors sell the securities to the Fed. The Fed gives the investors the money, which pumps money. Um, bank funds will increase. Interest rates will decrease. Aggregate spending increases. And we'll see economic growth increase. So that's the aim of stimulative monetary policy. Restrictive policy, the Fed sells securities and uh, so takes money out of the system. Bank funds decrease, interest rates increase, the aggregate spending decreases, and we see inflation decrease. So these are the two aims of the Fed, um, economic growth and inflation, uh, keeping inflation stable. Um, so stable prices, you'll remember that. And economic growth encourages full employment. So employment, and stable prices are uh, the two things that uh, the Fed is mandated to, to accomplish. Okay, so ideally the Fed would like to achieve both a very low level of unemployment and a very low level of inflation in the United States. However, there seems to be a bit of an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. When we see strong economic conditions, it leads to high inflation, uh, but low unemployment. When we see weak economic conditions, we tend to see low inflation, but high unemployment. So um, there's, there are other forces uh, on that trade-off. Historical data on annual inflation and unemployment rates show that when one of these problems worsens, the other does not automatically improve. So while there seems to be an inverse relationship, um, they don't always move at the same time. So here, here's our trade-off. So you can see on this side, we've got inflation, and on this side, we have unemployment. So if we have a, a high growth uh, scenario, uh, we expect to see high inflation, but low unemployment. Um, but when we see a weakness, we'll see, um, low inflation but high unemployment and so uh, the trade-off will be along this curve somewhere uh, along this curve so um, this curve can shift outward um, as a result of outside forces uh, for example uh, what if oil prices have increased substantially such that the minimum inflation rate would be higher. And so it will shift this entire curve outward. So there's still a trade-off, but inflation is much higher um, and unemployment is higher uh, at the same time. And so they've got to try and balance between these two points and find uh, the best solution for the economy. So outside forces can shift this backward or forward. So we're going to review just a few shifts in monetary policy over time. Uh, they seem to be a little bit of a yo-yo um, trying to balance. So in 2001 to 2003, there was a focus on improving the weak economy. Um, from 2004 to 2007, the focus, focus was on reducing inflation. From 2008 to 2015, again, the focus was on improving the weak economy after the credit crisis. Um, so we've been discussing up to this point monetary policy. So this is the Fed's um, 
what the Fed controls. They control monetary policy. Uh, but how does the monetary policy respond to fiscal policy? What is fiscal policy? Well, the Fed's monetary policy is commonly influenced by the administration's fiscal policy. So whoever's uh, in control of the, the Congress or the White House will have certain fiscal policies, um, either high spending um, or low spending. Um, so if fiscal pressures create large budget deficits, this may place upward pressure on interest rates and the Fed may feel pressure to use a stimulative monetary policy to reduce interest rates. So when the, when the federal government is running large budget deficits, it kind of forces the hand of the Fed to do uh, uh, implement certain monetary policies um, to keep inflation low. Fiscal policy shifts demand for loanable funds, but monetary policy has a larger impact on the supply of loanable funds. So the fiscal policy can shift demand, uh, monetary policy, has an impact on supply. And so the government can affect the demand curve while monetary policy mo um, mostly affects supply of loanable funds. So here's the framework for explaining how monetary policy and fiscal policy affect interest rates over time. So the US fiscal policy is right here in purple and you can see um, their fiscal policy uh, affects U.S. personal income tax rates. They can change the tax rates. Um, the U.S. budget deficit, the government can spend more than they bring in, and the U.S. business tax rates. And these will affect personal income level, uh, household demand for funds, government demand for funds, and U.S. business demand for funds. Um, also, they'll affect savings by U.S. households and the supply of funds in the United States. Uh, and the demand for funds in the United States. So here is where the US interest rate is. It's affected not only by the monetary policy, which affects the supply of funds, but it affects, uh, it's affected by US fiscal policy, which mostly affects demand for funds in the United States. And so it's a very difficult balancing act for the Fed to try and uh, reach when they're not in control of all the pieces. So there, there have been proposals to just focus on inflation, only on inflation. Um, and if you look at the mandates of some of the other central banks around the world, um, they don't have the same mandate for high employment. Now, that they may still work for that, um, but their primary, primary goal is stable prices or uh, uh, trying to focus on inflation. So. What are the advantages of inflation targeting? The Fed would no longer face a trade-off between controlling inflation and controlling unemployment. They would only have to focus on inflation and they can certainly zero in um, uh, much easier than trying to balance it between uh, controlling unemployment. The Fed would not have to consider responding to any fiscal policy actions. So whatever the federal government did, um, their focus would just be on controlling inflation. The Fed's role would be more transparent and would lead to less uncertainty in financial markets. Um, and the financial markets really do not like uncertainty. And so that there could be some positives there. But what are the disadvantages of inflation targeting? The Fed could lose credibility if the US inflation rate deviated substantially from their target inflation rate. And this is quite possible as well. Um, and so, um, it could result in a much higher unemployment level. And we do see that in other nations where their central bank's primary focus is uh, solely on inflation targeting. And as a result, uh, those countries tend to experience periods of much higher employment than the US has experienced. What about the impact on financial markets of monetary policy? Well, it affects the valuation of securities. Bond values are inversely related to interest rates. So when interest rates rise, bond values decrease. When interest rates decrease, bond values increase. Stock values are also affected by interest rate movements. 
Also, the Fed's communication to financial markets uh, play a big role. After the FOMC meeting, the conclusion is announced through an FOMC statement. The markets are always watching that, and we do see uh, movements um, as a result of what comes out uh, uh, on the FOMC statement. The impact of the Fed's response to the oil shock. Any event that might disrupt the world's production of oil triggers concerns about inflation. So the Fed does not have control over oil prices, but it can dampen any inflationary pressures if it slows economic growth. And so oil is a, is a big factor um, that uh, uh, they look at as we look, uh, looked at the beginning of this lecture. And so um, the Fed's response to oil shocks um, is uh, an important one. Okay, so here is um, how monetary policy affects financial conditions. We have the FOMC, um, they uh, have a money supply target. And so they're gonna be targeting um, a certain supply of loanable funds. On the other side, uh, there are inflationary expectations. And so there'll be a demand for loanable funds, which brings us to an equilibrium interest rate. And this affects cost of household credit. So mortgage rates, um, household consumption, and residential construction. On this side, it affects the cost of capital for corporations as well as corporate expansion. And so FOMC's uh, decisions, and when they announce, uh, it funnels through down to um, what everybody's expectation for economic growth uh, may be. This is exhibit 511, the impact of monetary policy across financial markets. So, and I won't read through all this. I encourage you to look at it in your book, um, but you can see the different types of financial markets, money market, bond market, mortgage market, stock market, and the foreign exchange. Each of these is affected in some way or another by the monetary policy of the Fed. What about the impact on financial institutions? Well, when interest rates rise, the cost of funds for financial institutions rises faster than the return they receive. Financial institutions such as commercial banks, bond, mutual funds, insurance companies, and pension funds maintain large portfolios of bonds. So their portfolios are adversely affected when the Fed rises, raises interest rates. As I mentioned before, there's an inverse relationship with uh, bond values. Uh, if interest rates rise, the value of a bond decreases. And so, um, financial institutions uh, and it, big in uh, pension funds, insurance companies are definitely affected um, by uh, rising, raising uh, of the interest rates. Stock mutual funds, insurance companies, and pension funds maintain large portfolios of stocks, and their stock portfolios are also indirectly affected by changes in interest rates. So it's an indirect effect, but it still is an effect. So up to this point, we've been just been talking within the borders of the United States. Um, but now we're going to look at how it affects um, uh, global monetary policy. Um, first, we'll look at the impact uh, of the dollar. If the U.S. economic conditions are weak, a weak dollar can stimulate the economy by stimulating U.S. exports and discouraging U.S. imports. So if the dollar weakens against another currency, that means our goods and services are cheaper to those living outside of the U.S. And so it will stimulate spending by those outside the U.S. to uh, want us to export. And it also discourages us importing goods from outside uh, because those goods become more expensive uh, in dollar terms. If the U.S. economic conditions are weak, a strong dollar will, will not provide the stimulus needed to improve conditions. The Fed may need to implement a stimulative monetary policy. Uh, what about the impact of global economic conditions? Well, because economic conditions are integrated across countries, uh, and that is becoming increasingly so every year, uh, the Fed considers prevailing global economic conditions when conducting monetary policy. Uh, we don't operate in a bubble. Um, and um, 
other economies are affected by us and we are affected by other economies. And so the Fed take, takes that into account. Um, the Fed's decision to lower U.S. interest rates during the 2008 credit crisis and stimulate the U.S. economy was partially driven by weak global economic conditions. Um, and so it wasn't just the U.S. that was struggling through that time. Um, it was uh, other nations. Um, and so because of that weak global economic condition, that was one of the, the reasons uh, of the implementation of the stimulus uh, in the U.S. economy. Um, global interest rates will also vary between countries. So uh, while interest rates may be high in one country, they could be low in another country, depending on that country's uh, monetary policy. Countries with higher rates will attract investors from countries with lower rates. What if you could invest in, say, a, a UK bond um, at twice uh, the rate that the US uh, bonds are paying? Well, that will attract, attract US investors um, to, to escape their lower rates and invest in, in higher rates. If investors leave due to US falling rates, the Fed may believe it should act to prevent rates from falling lower. So investors are leaving the US to and investing their money uh, internationally. So the Fed might uh, act to prevent rates from falling lower. Given the international integration in money and capital markets, a government's budget deficit can affect the interest rates of various countries referred to as the global crowding out. And we'll look at that right here. So, okay, exhibit 5.12 in your book shows an illustration of global crowding out. Um, and we can see that an increase in the US budget deficit causes an outward shift in the federal government's demand for US funds and therefore in the aggregate demand for US funds. So we see this shift, and we can see what the shift does to interest rates within the US. Interest rates increase from I1 to I2. As US rates rise, they attract funds from investors in other countries. So uh, here we've got Germany and Japan. So German and, and Japanese investors see the rising interest rates in the United States. And so um, uh, as foreign investors use more of their funds to invest in US securities, the supply of available funds in their respective countries decline. So we'll see uh, as the money shifts to overseas, it shifts the supply in their respective countries up. So it'll drive interest rates up in their respective countries as well. Uh, this is what we call global crowding out. And it's generally uh, as a result of um, budget deficits and fiscal policy um, by nations. Now let's uh, quickly look at the impact of the crisis in Greece on the European monetary policy. So uh, the Greek crisis, um, they uh, really struggled financially in the spring of 2010. Greece experienced a weak economy and a large budget deficit. Um, Creditors were less willing to lend to the Greek government um, because they feared that the government may be unable to repay the loans. So the ECB, European Central Bank, was forced to use a more stimulative monetary policy than they desired in order to ease concerns about the Greek crisis, even though this caused other concerns about potential infl inflation in the Eurozone. So um, there are other countries that were not struggling um, but because uh, of the union here and working underneath one central bank, um, the European Central Bank was forced to implement stimulative monetary policy, which helped head off uh, the crisis in Greece, but also created potential uh, inflation concerns in other countries throughout the Eurozone. So just as a summary to, to finish up, by using monetary policy, the Fed can affect the interaction between the demand for money and the supply for money, which affects interest rates, aggregate spending, and economic growth. As the Fed increases the money supply, the interest rates should decline and result in more aggregate spending because of cheaper financing rates and higher economic growth. On the flip side, as the Fed decreases the money supply, interest rates should increase 
and result in less aggregate spending because of higher financing rates. Lower economic growth will occur and lower inflation. A stimulative monetary policy can increase economic growth, but it could ignite demand pull inflation. A restrictive monetary policy is likely to reduce inflation, but may also reduce economic growth. Thus, the Fed faces a trade-off when implementing monetary policy. Given a possible trade-off, the Fed tends to pinpoint its biggest concern, unemployment versus inflation, and assesses whether the potential benefits of any proposed monetary policy outweigh the potential adverse effects. Um, so we see this, it's a, a pendulum swing, um, and they only act as it gets outside of um, uh, where they would like to be. Because monetary policy can have a strong influence on interest rates and economic growth, it affects the valuation of most securities traded in financial markets. Financial market participants attempt to forecast the Fed's future monetary policies and the effects of these policies on economic conditions. When the Fed implements monetary policy, financial market participants attempt to assess how their security holdings will be affected and adjust their security portfolios accordingly. For instance, um, a lot of bond portfolios, if they foresee um, uh, issues in the future, um, they may uh, sell uh, their long-term holdings and go to short-term holdings. And so they, they try and anticipate um, issues in the future. Finally, the Fed's monetary policy must take into account the global economic environment. A weak dollar may increase U.S. exports and thereby stimulate the U.S. economy. If economies of other countries are strong, this can also increase U.S. exports and boost the U.S. economy. Thus, the Fed may not have to implement stimulative monetary policy if international conditions can provide some stimulus to the U.S. economy. Conversely, the Fed may consider a more aggressive monetary policy to fix a weak U.S. economy if international conditions are weak, since in that case, the Fed cannot rely on the other economies to boost the U.S. economy. Now that uh, summarizes what we reviewed in lecture number five. If you have any questions, please reach out to me uh, during my office hours. If those times don't work for you, um, then you can uh, shoot me an email and we'll schedule a time to chat. Thank you very much.